we just standing there talking and then like the guy who works security at the bar he just walks in and he just goes well they're calling people outside to kick your ass now. <laughs> so we have to sneak you out through this other Chinese place that we're connected <laughs> <Really> to <nice>. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just get you out of here because they they're gonna be here and they're criminals so basically <laughs> they're gonna come here Hello and welcome to Deus Ex Comedian. My name is Ryan Bussell. I'll be your host. I am an American living in Sweden since 2006 and a comic since 2011. On this podcast, I'll be talking to comics who have retired uh, or they're taking a long break or they simply quit the grind and they're happy to perform just a handful of times per year. So what made them slow down or even stop performing altogether? Is there anything about the grind that they miss? Most importantly, without approval from drunk strangers, how instead do they fill that dark hole inside where a soul should be? Let's find out. My guest this week is a good friend and also someone who loves a good ginger joke, Jim (laughs) Gruen. Thank you, man. (laughs) Thank you. Thanks for coming to my place. Thank you. Thank you. You're doing good? You got your driver's license? Yeah, yeah. Got it yesterday. It was... A hassle, and I fucking hated every moment of trying to get it. But finally, I have that shit, and I can get a car, and I can just drive by myself. It's weird for me cause from the states. I mean, getting a license is that's life. Like you, you start mm. if you're lucky, you start when you're where I'm from, sixteen to learn, mm. and then you get your license at seventeen. So Some states have like sixteen. That it can be lower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't be drive a car when I was sixteen. <laughs> And it's also like it's much easier though in the states. Also, mm-hmm. the process is way more complicated. Like for us, the our, our attitude is, you get a license, and then you learn to drive. Mm-hmm. And here, it's, <laughs> as it should be, is the opposite. But don't you have like an overrepresentation in like accidents by with sixteen and seventy year old yes. people? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. But there's no connection between our attitude and that. That's just a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> it's a complete coincidence. It's the same thing with the gun control. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's just coincidence. Well, it's, it's good to see you. As it's always. good to see you too, yeah. man. It's good to see you. It's been a while now. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, it's been a few months, right? Yeah, it has been. Yeah, mm-hmm. we've and before that, it was even longer. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah God damn. We need to start doing this more often. <laughs> we should. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, thinking about, like, thinking about you, and like thinking about when we met, and I don't remember. Uh, I was actually I was talking to uh, Yana Savanova about this. Mm-hmm. She's also another comic that, like, I just have known her. I, I can't pinpoint a time when I met her. Mm-hmm. And she says she's had experience a lot. Like she she thinks like, for comics it's almost like by osmosis. Like you just like you go you have like a period of life when you don't know those people and then you just know them. Yeah, yeah. Then there's no real beginning. Yeah, but I can't remember like a, a, the single moment where I met you, but. I re- remember, like we talked about this a couple of times, the whole the whole story about us seeing a comic that's I don't need to name names or anything, but it's like it's a really popular comic, and you and I were both equally unamused, and we <laughs> caught each other's eyes, like just just not laughing and not thinking it was funny at all, and everybody else dying, just the whole room just <laughs> dying, just wallowing over in their chairs and everything, and we you and I were just equally unamused by him. No, I actually think I'm telling that story because I also remember because that's that's the moment I feel like I bonded with you <laughs> because I was at this gig. It was one of the biggest ones that had ever done. And Where was it? Do you remember? Yeah, it was the uh, School of Economics. Oh, uh, it was like a college yeah, yeah, show. Yeah. It was like the big theater with a ton of people. It was, yeah, yeah. No, that was really, really on because I've known you since from the start when I began. Hmm. That's why I've known you that long. But I remember just, just watching him and I had a lot of respect for the guy and mm-hmm. he was slaughtering, mm-hmm. but his jokes aren't really for me. Yeah. And I looked over at you, and you were like slumped against the wall, like your arms folded. It looked like you were <laughs> dying every, every second. I just, <laughs> just thinking, like, wait, we're allowed to feel that way? It's it's okay. Yeah, back then I was way more angry, also. So like, I would just feel like I was just literally dying listening to his fucking <laughs> stupid shit. But now I, I I totally respect him, and like I'm in the wrong. He's doing tours, this guy. <laughs> so I'm in the wrong. I, he's funny, and I just don't get it. That's what's happening. <laughs> well, how long? When did you start? Mm, let's see. I started about 
It must have been around like 2010, 2011, maybe. Okay. I, I started in 2011. You started you were... in 2011. Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe I was a, like a year in when we started me seeing each other. And uh, I started at the the place where a lot of comics started, like Bungie Comedy, mm. the competition where you have to. The, the, what appealed to me was the whole uh, the rule set of you don't you can't have performed anywhere else. This has to be your first time at the, at this event. And uh, so that drew drew me in because I always wanted to do comedy. Like I I always loved stand up. Like ever since I was a kid. I watched a lot of stand up. Uh, I watched Lengdi Brunnen, like the Swedish show on in the state television. It was a lot of fun. I just sat glued on the TV watching that shit. And but I, I believed I I couldn't do it. Like uh, you have to be way more witty and smart. Like it's, there's one thing to be funny among among friends, and there's one thing to actually write material and perform it. But. When I saw this contest, I figured like, why not? I can just try, it's just three minutes. So I can bomb for three minutes and <laughs> just walk off. That doesn't matter. And uh, I invited about 50 friends in this theater that took like 200. And uh, so of course they laughed. They laughed their asses off at everything I said, but they're my friends. Right. So in the next room I performed, I felt like I was the shit. Like I, I performed at Komikase that Mike Resinen oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. ran, and uh, I basically have like four friends there in a room full, packed room, and I just felt like, oh well, I, I got this handled. Like the first time just went <laughs> off without a hitch, so this time will be no no different, and I can just improvise a little. This doesn't matter, and fuck me, like I could hear the dishwashing machine like go on in the background i could hear people like correct their things like <laughs> the clickety clack of the table and that was so awful so i thought about quitting right there and then <laughs> but yeah that's where i started like at the bungee comedy show uh eight comics performing in a row uh and uh, under celine hosted it uh with uh klaus Okerboom. Mm -hmm. And actually, one of the middle comics performing was the, was the now household name Soran Ishmael. Really? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the Knivsta native, the proud hometown boy. <laughs> he performed like in between, but the, back then he was a big deal. So I, was, I felt like, oh, well, shit, like he's performing. And then I believe Bera Druspe also performed, like after him even. So uh, it was a, a really fun experience. And uh, I performed last out of the eight comics. So I basically had to sit and watch seven shit three minutes <laughs> <laughs> before I could go on. And I was so nervous. So just pacing back and forth, just sweating. Just, I feel like I could vomit like right there on the spot. And it was, I was so tense. I was so tense. Like I was tense like a month before. Like I have anxiety issues. And that didn't do wonders for my anxiety issues, <laughs> basically. I had a month of just fucking, just constant anxiety, just walking around, just, holy fuck, holy fuck, I'm doing this. I'm not doing, am I? Am I really fucking doing it? Oh, fuck. Fuck, 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 fuck. But yeah, that, that was it. It was, I did it and it went, it went really well and I went on home on a high, basically, from the first time. How did you do in the competition fun. itself? Uh, they had this, like, system where, one person passed on to the finals right away and everybody else went to the semifinals and get another chance uh, and i went to the semifinals and i didn't get i didn't get picked the first time and i, I didn't get picked the, the second time either so okay. they, they basically just went out and uh i i remember i spoke to bad other years later about uh, my performance there and he said, like, yeah, you were just fucking awful. I, I, I didn't even want to just talk to you because you were so shitty. <laughs> so that was a lot of fun to hear, like, a couple of years later. So, yeah, yeah, I, I went out. I went out. I, I didn't even remember who won. Like, I, I believe he just... I saw him, like, a couple of years later, but he didn't even perform anymore. So and that was a shame, actually, because he was a lot of fun. Hmm. It was really funny. He had a lot of... He had proper like stand-up guy material like he did it did really good so uh, it's a shame 
It's a shame. It's a lot. It's a shame. A lot of people who quit. Actually, a lot of people I met over the years. But uh, yeah, I went out in the semifinals <laughs> of Bungie comedy. Yeah, just uh, when I was preparing for this podcast mm -hmm. and just like thinking, uh, I've known several people who have like I've known uh, I know I've been close to people, some people mm -hmm. who have quit completely. Mm -hmm. But like, there's no way I could actually tell you how many people I've seen come and go. I've seen so mm -hmm. many people yeah, just try yeah. for a few months and then, or if even that, and then just just vanish. Yeah. But I know I know a lot more people who just just have to slow down. Like they used to be out like seven nights a week, mm -hmm. and now they're out once a month. Yeah. If that, like, there's people I'm just I was just used to seeing all the time, mm -hmm. and now I barely see them. Yeah, they burn out. Some but, people but, just burn out. And I was just curious, like. For this preparing for this podcast, I was just curious. Like, so who do I know that fits kind of fits this pattern, fits this mold? Mm -hmm. and I just went through my like list on Facebook, just friends, just mm -hmm. like thinking through, and I got like the fifty names, <laughs> easy, easily. <laughs> I was just like, damn, it's like so many people. Yeah, and a lot of entertaining people, like unfortunately. So the and it was a lot of fun performing when I when I did it like more back in the days. But what basically burned me out was the whole uh, the train ride uh, from Uppsala to Stockholm every time. Yeah, because you're an hour away. Yeah, really. it's an hour away and it's an hour back. And I work the day after. It's basically a lot of weekdays where I'm gone the whole evening. And uh, I'm coming home at around 1 o'clock at night. And then I get, get up, work, and then maybe perform again that very next night at another place. So that basically just burned me out. And I felt like no joy performing anymore after a while because it was just so, so much hassle, like going back and forth. And I just took a, took a little while off and realized like, well, this felt really, really good <laughs> taking <laughs> some time off. So maybe I'll take some more time off and then more and more and more. And then I basically performed once a year after that. Hmm. And you know how it is like when you when you can't come up with new material either because you're not performing as much so then it becomes less fun to perform like it's a vicious circle of like a right. rock uh, because you're not performing you're not coming up with new material and that's why you don't think it's as fun anymore so that's basically what happened to me so i've been thinking about it like some new jokes and everything but every time i perform nowadays like five or six friends want to come and watch and I don't want to fuck up in front of them so I just do my safe shit like every time well, don't tell your friends you're gonna do it no, yeah that's basically what I need to do I just need to hide <laughs> I just need to hide now COVID and everything so now it's really hard to perform anyway so well that's me it really felt natural to me to just not perform anymore <laughs> basically well, one thing I'm curious about because you, you mentioned earlier uh, you used to be much angrier. Yeah. And that's when I thought of when it comes to you. Because when I, when I first met you, like even when you were happy, you weren't, you weren't having a good time. <laughs> you could feel, you could still, there was, there was like anger, like it could just like scratch the surface and there's just this <laughs> anger that was there. Yeah. And then that's, that went away. I mean, yeah. I, haven't, I haven't felt that from you in a very long time. No, that, like I evolved as a person, okay. <laughs> basically through the years. And uh, I worked a lot of, on myself, like through my, anxiety problems I had to look at who I am and what makes me tick and everything and uh, basically it's actually a Swedish comics fault basically <laughs> because uh, I was such a huge fan of Magnus Bettner and uh, I used to watch him religiously like all his DVDs I have at home I have some signed even from hmm. when I was just a fan and um, I just loved his like angry like vicious style that he had and um, it basically inspired me when I was with my friends to be like a little angry at things and like be funny about it but basically what that did was it I actually trained my mind to just look at things negatively because I need material hmm. for when I'm hanging out with my friends because they think this shit is funny so and then you basically become angry like for real like you with all this fucking mindfulness shit and everything you can read like you can actually train your mind to become a certain way and that's what i basically what i did i just started looking at everything negatively and i was just a really hateful uh, angry person and i used to always talk about 
things like that. I hated them so much. I fucking hate this and I hated this. Nowadays, I realize like you you don't hate this. You just dislike this. You don't. <laughs> that's base. That's barely hate at all. So, but back in the day, yeah, definitely, I was a lot more angry. I was a lot more angry, and I was really just just stupid shit. Like I could get super angry about like somebody. Uh, when I'm walking in a store, you know, and like some people pass on through like a shelf and they walk right in front of you and they walk slow. <laughs> I could become like super pissed off and like even walk around at home like this fucking person just walking and fucking didn't even fucking see me. Everything. Oh, I'm not, like, I'm invisible apparently. And I was just, it just spiraled on to like this bullshit thing that was me and that just spurred on my anxiety basically. <laughs> so I just realized I like I need to work on this and I need to be become a happier person because I feel better when I'm a happier person so that's basically what happened like over the many many years of work on myself and my mind that's basically what it evolved to like so it's not it's not there I, I still have it like it, there's it's still there some days like some bad days but uh, all in all I'm just so much happier and I'm just so much I'm very very happy about that also like that I'm moved on from that part of my life and mm. the persona that I basically had because it was just wasn't good it was just wasn't good for my soul and for my body and my mind and everything so yeah that's what happened <laughs> well do you feel like there's some connection between kind of letting go of the anger and also letting go of stand-up no no basically no no and I don't think so at least like I, I don't see the connection there because basically I was like that angry person also without the stage like even before I performed the first time I was already an angry person mm. and uh, it basically I for sure maybe when I when I think about it maybe it spurred it on a little maybe it just worsened it a little because of the whole like traveling making me tired and that making me easier to get angry and you know that maybe it spiraled on from there but no, I don't be really believe like that. Just me quitting made me happier. It just uh, I could have performed and still be been more happy, more happy person. Just be just from the, my habits and from what I did, basically. Cause I felt like shit back then. Also, like I, you know, when you do stand up, like there's always free beer and everything. So you just poured on beer and everything and I wasn't like drinking until I got drunk or anything like that but I got fat <laughs> I got fat from all that fucking McDonald's and burgers and then just a beer here a beer there so that and that made me feel worse about myself and when I felt worse about myself the angry person came in and said well you don't fucking care about that anyway hmm. and but I did really I just pushing it down and that you know when when you push things down that just makes it worse so so to answer your question like no I don't really think uh, that quitting made me happier it's just I worked on myself like way before I even quit to become happier and then uh, and that that's basically what happened yeah. uh, one question I ask is Here's one thing I've never personally related to, but I've heard comics say it throughout history. Mm -hmm. This idea of uh, that first time I was on stage, that first laugh I got, mm -hmm. it, it was like crack. Like I, was, I just, I just, I just had to come back. I had to keep going back. For the, mm -hmm. Had to get the laugh. I had to get the laugh, and mm -hmm. I just had to keep coming back for that. And I, I never myself never felt that. It, did you? Was this when you experienced? Like, did you have that feeling? Mm, the first time I. Uh, I performed. I, of course, like I told you, I did. I did really, really well because I have a lot of friends in the in the audience. Uh, but yeah, I was basically on a high after that. Like not from any specific laugh. Like this made me really like tick. But for the contest, and it was way nicer than uh, nicer style of comedy. Like you want glance more, mm. more than Magnus Petner, and I wanted me more. To, be Magnus Petner than Johan Glantz, obviously. <laughs> Even though Johan Glantz is really funny, and I and I actually been to his shows a lot of times, uh, it still just wasn't me. But then I wrote like new material the fourth time, and I performed with that, and <laughs> I, uh, I I remember this. It was also at Komikaze, uh, Mike Rasset, and again gave me time, um, and I performed. 
uh, I've written this like new six minute uh, material thing that I was gonna do and I said hi I'm Jim and I just forgot everything I just forgot every single <laughs> word I ever <laughs> studied about that whole set and and uh, this one like girl like old lady in the audience basically went, well come on come on and then she just applauded everybody and everybody applauded like a whole round and then it all came back to me hmm. and from there I was just basically crushing like it, it went really really well and that's when I got the for real real high like of holy shit like this went so good I could actually do this for a living like oh my god this is so good so good and I basically I think I actually got more of a reaction because people saw how nervous I was from the beginning and then I actually turned it around to have really good material uh, and that just spiraled it on it was just so funny so funny to perform and so funny to like uh, uh, you know it was just I just had a really good set and even like someone shouted something from the audience and I just came back with something that was just funny hmm. I don't even remember what it was but even that was felt good also like oh, I even improvised and it fucking worked and so from that that fucking point on then that then I was addicted to that uh, that feeling that high of the whole like oh it was uh, it felt it feels awesome to perform but you then you may you didn't really get hooked on that laugh that no one, like, no I, I never had that not not the laugh for me it was more but when I when I write material or, or think of a joke mm -hmm. or think of a set, I'm thinking, okay, well, I hope I hope they laugh. I hope the audience laughs here. I hope they groan here. I hope they applaud there. Mm -hmm. And so when I when I do the set in reality and they react exactly the way I want them to, mm -hmm. then that I feel good. No, oh, anyway. but it's not. I wouldn't say it's necessarily the the, the laugh. No, anyway. no, like, no, like, like there's there's some laughs that even hits you like. I would describe it almost as a shock wave of laugh coming in when everybody just starts laughing at the same time that you can basically feel that in your body when you're standing on stage and I could feel that like pour pouring through my veins basically yeah. <laughs> so that I would got addicted to that thing but then for sure like the whole uh, later on I really love the reaction of the mixed groan with laughter like I, I started loving that fun one because <laughs> that was so much more fun to to play with like the whole oh, <laughs> oh like that whole thing <laughs> that was that was a lot of fun yeah i, I had a, i had that I, I think a lot of comics go through this period of like when you, when you first start and you really just want to entertain the crowd you really want you really want to make them laugh mm -hmm. and then it gets to be fun to make them groan <laughs> instead <laughs> And I feel like maybe at some point you either develop out of that phase or that becomes your thing. Your thing. Yeah. <laughs> so I, mean, I had a period when I had Down syndrome jokes. I mean, Down syndrome was a punchline for me. Yeah. And that, that lasted for a bit. Yeah, it lasted a good while. And I mm -hmm. thought, that, okay, it actually is more fun to make them laugh. So I kind of steered <laughs> away from, from that. <laughs> and then Donnie then wrote an article about it. Yeah, I'm hoping I talked to him on this podcast, actually. I'm talking mm -hmm. about that exact thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, did you con contact him or anything? Not yet. I'm not yeah, gonna ask him. A little early, early controversy in my in my career. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. That would be awesome. <laughs> he's doing bands now or something, isn't he? Like he's mar he's like marketing his like Spotify, uh, like he's in a band and playing bass or something. Oh, really? Yeah, I think oh. so. I'm not I'm not sure though. I haven't spoken to him like in several years. Yeah, and that's the same for, same for me. Like, again, he's like one of the people I thought of. Like, I oh, used to see him all the time doing his locked on impersonations. Yeah, and, yeah. But I think he did that recently. I I, I had to check with him to see what yeah. he's up to. He used to work on he worked on radio there for a while, like as a comic relief guy and everything. And then he just vanished, like you said. And then I started seeing like him, him marketing his like Spotify things all the time. Okay. And he's like standing in those fucking band pictures, <laughs> <laughs> those, those looking away afar things where you, <laughs> <laughs> where you don't. Oh, uh, there's no camera here. I don't really know. And they just kind of look like that. That's... that. That's the bizarre thing about Facebook for me because that, I mean that was a way that I just kept in touch with people or just saw what they're up to. So, but it's all based on an algorithm. So, like for Paul, for example, Paul, I had. I knew he was like doing commentary for MMA. I had no really no idea what else he was doing. Mm -hmm. And I just went to his page and actually saw, okay, he has a podcast. He's been doing it for a while. Mm -hmm. like he's, and he's constantly promoting it. Mm -hmm. And it never comes to my feed. 
<laughs> so for me, it's like, I have no, I have no idea. I have <laughs> no idea what's going on. Yeah, I, I removed so many people like I that I don't see their updates just because of that fucking algorithm, just placing people I don't really want to see anyway. So yeah. I just removed a lot of them. So now now I see more of what I actually want to see on on that. But then people are moving away from Facebook instead, like and people are shutting down their accounts and just yeah. using Messenger and everything. So that was it was not worthwhile basically to clear that air, air of fucking <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> But well, you're not not necessarily very active on social media. No, anyway. I'm I'm in there a lot, but I don't post that much because I always come come down to that thought of like, is it this even worth posting? Hmm. Like, uh, is this do people really care about this? Like, uh, because sometimes I even write like a status thing, and then I just go like, oh, nah. <laughs> <laughs> nah, this is just gonna start a discussion or something, and I don't want a discussion. I like uh, I used to be a lot of like po- posting a lot on social media and I used to always like air what I thought and stuff like that and I end up in, ended up like everybody else like end up in arguments online and everything hmm. and, uh, but then I just realized like yeah you're just the best retarded person in this <laughs> in this discussion like so this and you know, nobody wins really and nobody really tells like changes their mind in those discussions no, or anything. They really don't. And then, so the basically, like, why? Why do this? It just brings me more anxiety, more anger, and everything. So I just, I just moved away from it a lot. But I, I do post like every once in a while, but it's it's far in between now. Far in between. I just have shit to do, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Instead That's of being good. social That's media. A good thing. <laughs> I, have, I really like slow down a lot myself like it really wasn't that long ago relatively speaking but i'd go on facebook and just go through the news feed and just just scroll mm-hmm. even though i wasn't interested in like most of the stuff i was seeing just mm-hmm. scroll 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 mm-hmm. and now it's like okay i'll make i'll make a I'll put a joke on there or i'll put, post a picture mm-hmm. and I just go on do it and maybe scroll like a page maybe mm-hmm. and then just back off <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, i i i can't blame being busy for it because i'm not busy at all now because i just <laughs> rather do anything else <laughs> Just it's either staring into the wall yeah. or doing this <laughs> now. There's TV. There's Xbox. <laughs> no shit. Social media, man. But yeah. I was I was gonna say, uh, you told me again recently, relatively speaking, but it wasn't that long ago. You you told me you were gonna do a gig and it was your two hundredth gig. Yeah. And I was really surprised by that because, like I said, if you were around, like you were already established as far as I was concerned mm-hmm. when I started. I got to like 200th gig within two years. Yeah. So I was really, I was really surprised. But then I shouldn't have been surprised because you you live far away, you took a long break. I just had a feeling you had just done a lot more. A lot more by by then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, But that basically you hit the nail right there. But because you lived in Solna back then. Yeah, I was much closer down. It was really close, much closer, and like I couldn't be, like sure I could do more gigs like the whole week if I wanted to. But it was like, how much is that gonna tear on me just from the whole fucking train and working and everything like that? Hmm. Uh, so I just basically did, did, I limited it to like three gigs a week at most. Uh, so that's basically why it took so long to hit, hit the 200 for me. But I had a good gig, I remember 200, it was in Mafia. Yeah. Mm, it was in Mafia in the, in the Bora Bar, I believe I did it. No, this was this is this is just the year. This was recent. Mm-hmm. It was in Malmen then. Hmm. Oh yeah, maybe. Or Malmen. I could be wrong. Maybe Malmen or Baras Bakke or something like that. Yeah, I don't really remember, remember when I think about it now. It was mafia. <laughs> mafia. <laughs> That's one thing with time. I, I think of things as, as being recent, and they could have been like, oh, oh it was eight years ago. Or, uh, <laughs> like, oh crap! <laughs> I thought it happened like last year. You're still stressed about nine yeah. eleven, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Shit, that happened yesterday. Well, didn't it? That's a, that happened twenty years ago. <laughs> yeah, twenty. And then and for me, like, when we say twenty years ago, I, I'm thinking eighties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Like a twenty year old, like a person actually became uh, like legal in, in like I don't really really know the English expression for it. Like the uh, eighteen, basically, he turned eighteen, and he turned two more years, and he can go to fucking sustain Bologna. He was born that day. Yeah. <laughs> And now you can go to the system blog and just shop, shop alcohol. 
God damn. I always put it put like age in that like sort of sentence like okay uh, I did this and now a person born that day can drive a moped in Sweden like they're 16 they can drive a car in fucking America yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that just fucks my head sometimes it just fucks up my head I never I don't I'm, I turned 46 this year and I 46 I know, but I, I never really, I don't, I never, age never really mattered that much to me. Like, I never really thought much of it. I didn't You're have not stressed third, about it at all? No, I didn't, I didn't have like a 30 year crisis or, mm. or you know, a 40 year crisis. Mm. Uh, just, I just don't really think about it. Mm. But I think about it now and then. Like, I went, I went to a, went to a, a Holtzfred mm. music festival. This is, this was years ago. Yeah. And uh, so I was there, and like next to our camp, there was uh, a couple. The guy was from the United States. Mm. It was his first time in Sweden, it was a Swedish girlfriend. And we're having a conversation, like, you don't understand Swedish at all. But we're, like, talking about Sweden and America, what's better here, what's better there. And then she said, uh, like, sh that she thinks the person number is a much better system than in the U.S. We have the social security yeah, number, yeah, social security. Uh, which is, like, essentially random numbers. Mm -hmm. But she said the person number, you know, it makes much more sense because it's, it's, it's the year you year were born and your month, month, and a day. Mm -hmm. so she's, like, for example, my, my person number is 93, blah, blah, blah. And then they really hit me then, like, holy shit, like, I'm talking to, I'm talking to an adult <laughs> who was born the year that I graduated high school. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. And I definitely feel my age in stand-up, because in stand-up, it's, it's all 20-year-olds. It's, it's all, it's all, <laughs> like, oh, my God, I'm going to turn 30 in seven years. Like, shut, shut, shut up. <laughs> it's 46, huh? Yeah, my dad turns... 54 this year. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> He's eight years older than you. <laughs> oh my god. That's why it's bizarre too. Like, all my you know, making friends and stand up, and my friends are all, you know, like half my age. <laughs> so I remember, uh, so our, our mutual friend, Henrich, yeah. it was like, half my age. Yeah. But he was telling me, like, a, like a sex story. <laughs> like, like some experience he'd think he had to have with his girlfriend. Mm hmm. And I was just like, like I can't. I'm not gonna repeat it now, but I, 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 I can't relate. I can't, I can't <laughs> eat with this because, like, for me, like, like that wild story, like with my friends at that age, would have been like, we had sex on the first date. Oh my god, she's crazy. <laughs> now it's <laughs> way more advanced than that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now they're fucking doing pirouettes and everything. <laughs> yeah, fucking Henrich, fucking big head face <laughs> asshole. Fuck my dick. <laughs> For water? Yeah, sure. But if I if I remember right, you you took a break when you moved even farther away. Yeah. But then you kind of came back. Yeah, what, I came back a little. Like I did a little bit more. I actually stepped it up a little when I moved back to Uppsala, uh, because I lived for a while out in like this hillbilly <laughs> hillbilly <laughs> place, like I would call the Alosa. Outside of Uppsala, it's like 40 minutes with a bus just to get to Uppsala, and then another hour to get to Stockholm. Yeah. So it was, like, it was just too much, too much for me to go there. So, but yeah, yeah. But when I moved back to Uppsala, I, I tried it a little more, but I just felt like I felt off, you know, and I just didn't have the timing and everything, and I just didn't want to do the work to get back to where I was <laughs> basically, and I. And the whole fucking new material thing, uh, no new material, and uh, yeah, that and that burned me out again. So I was just like, ah, oh, no, I just don't really feel like it. I don't feel the same like want or need to get on stage. Because hmm. you know this, like the whole thing with uh, you, you think of a joke, and immediately you think like, I need to get on stage now. Right to get this out of me just to I want to get this get this out and I, you're excited about it and you really want to perform I, I just lost that feeling somewhere along the road I don't really know where but somewhere along there I just lost it completely and I just felt too comfortable at home and everything and so but I perform every once in a while nowadays but it's basically just a run through of my old shit like the whole same, the same same j fucking jokes all the time and they just <laughs> they just tires me out again so, so but I, but I, but I want to perform like once covid over i want to perform like uh, every once in a while and just try it out and who knows maybe i will get the whole joy for it back one day 
Uh, I also got to- so tired because like I, I feel like in stand up there was a lot of kissing ass to get ahead, basically, hmm. and I just hated seeing that work for a lot of people, and. Uh, like some, so most stand up people, I was just happy for them. Like, you get to perform on Raw, that's fucking awesome. Like, uh, that's that's so cool. Like, and that's so cool that I know you and now you perform at Raw. But then there were some people who were just like, You're not even, you, you're not that talented. You, I saw you talk to this guy and just kiss his ass all the time, and now you're performing at this place. And I, like, oh, I just got so tired of that thing, too. I think it's a very common feeling amongst, amongst comics. Yeah, I also think I also think it's part of like kind of our, our development as comics. Also, like when you, when you first start, you have that feeling of like, oh my god, I can't believe I'm here. Like you see other comics that are around, like oh my god, like they they're so experienced, they know what they're doing. Blah, blah, blah. Mm. Like, oh my god, I'm so I'm here. Mm. And then it takes about six like six months later, it's just like, oh, fuck that guy. I'm like, <laughs> why, why is he performing there? I'm I should be there. I'm fired than him. I'm better. Yeah. I'm better than him. I was talking to uh, Paul Devaya about that thing too, but about the um. Uh, when it comes to the length of time, it looks like the, the experience you have mm-hmm. compared. Like Stockholm was bizarre that way, because in like if you like in London or in New York, and you've been born for less than ten years, then you are clearly a rookie. Mm-hmm. And here it's like I've performed three times in six months. I'm an established comic now. Like, <laughs> there's not not much. Uh, what do you call it? It's like a level of self awareness. So just mm-hmm. realize like okay, I'm not that experienced yet. Mm-hmm. You can you can still be a rookie even after a few years. Yeah, exactly. I actually have I have a funny Paul Devaya story, uh, and uh, if Paul ever sees this, I I, I love you, Paul. Just this this <laughs> fucking this whole thing was just so stupid, and uh, because Paul was emceeing at Mafia and I was performing, and uh, he was gonna bring me up on stage, and uh, he did some material like in between every comic, uh, but then. When it was time to introduce me, I'm standing there in the stairs at Mafia, just waiting to get on stage. And he starts playing a YouTube clip on his phone, and he's holding it up to the mic and just playing it out <laughs> like that's his that's his warm up for me. He's just playing that whole that whole like like I, I don't know what it was like a Kenyan pastor going like they eat the poopo, they eat oh, yeah, the poopo, so they lick yeah. they lick the poopo and something like that. I don't really remember what it was, but he just played that out. That was his like. Oh, and now Jim Kroon after this YouTube clip, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> was so stupid. <laughs> and I was just standing. It was just going on and on, and people were just so unamused by the whole situation. <laughs> like you're playing a, a clip instead of talking about it. And oh my god. Yeah, like I said, I love you, Paul, but that was fucking stupid. I forgot to bring up with Paul uh, <laughs> another story I have about him, also Mafia. So it's in that stairwell next to the stage mm-hmm. where the comics used to hang out. We watch person on stage, and he had he brought, uh, had a girl there with him, and she stood in that stairwell with the rest of us. So she was like in front of us, mm-hmm. with me and a few other people. She was in front of us watching whatever, whatever comic was on stage, and then she just blasted a fart, just like a. It was clearly a fart, and it was clearly her, and it stank. So the rest was behind her, and, I, and she like she pretended not to move, like she like didn't notice anything, and we were just like like choking and also dying, trying not to <laughs> laugh, brutally laugh, which we did after she left. But then she went uh, up to Paul after the show, and she said, uh, "Oh, it was it was so weird. I was staying I was staying watching the show, and uh, my shoe broke." <laughs> so, okay, well, it stank too. <laughs> Your shoe broke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that fucking that staircase is fucking legendary. That's where that's where Alireza walked up to me, uh, uh, and he said, uh, "Jim, Jim, what's this?" Mm. Mm. I said, "I don't know." He says, "It's a gay T Rex." <laughs> <laughs> that was so fucking stupid. <laughs> it was so stupid. So typical fucking him. I know, I love that guy too. We we're, were also at our bar. Me and Alaresa were singing at the bar one night, just talking, and all of a sudden, like, there's like, you could smell like shit, like something's burning. Mm-hmm. And then look over, and he had, he was wearing a sweater, 
and he like put his arm over like with like a, like a tea candle on the bar <laughs> and just lit his sweater on fire. All he just didn't even know us at all. <laughs> And he's so he's so weird and awkward and I just yeah I just I love that guy. He's, yeah, he he so won. Uh, was, I forget where it was. It was like a comic, comic or something. Like yeah, that. he's gonna yeah. say it was like I think it was like the, like the comics uh, Christmas table, the Yule, mm. Yule board. Yeah, 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 he got comics comic and yeah, that's a well deserved. Award. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was a lot of fun, and he always hated when you told him he was weird and awkward. And everything. Do you remember that discussion we had in the car, like out in Vedder? Yeah. Yeah. When we, when I just called him weird, and he just took so much offense. <laughs> to me calling, I'm saying it in a positive way. Like I, I like you because you're weird. Like that's the fun part of hanging out with you because you never know what you're gonna say or do, <laughs> and that's the fun part. Like when nobody else does that, and that's weird. <laughs> like can you just understand that it is not so negative as you try to make it to be. <laughs> Yeah, but I was a lot of fun. A lot of fun with him. I was uh, again about under bar bar. I was mentioning that to, to Paul is that I don't want to be that person that like looks back at the past and thinks like, oh like things were so much better than or more fun than. But I, I do miss that. But like, I have like a lot of like fond memories mm -hmm. from that from that bar. Yeah, under bar bar was fucking awesome. It was just really, really, really awesome. It was just a great hangout, like the backstage area. Yeah, there. that's why I enjoyed it the most. Mm -hmm. Just the hang. You could just walk down there and like no people, just comics, and you could just hang. It was just even like a smoke room right there. It was. Funny. Oh, yeah, I didn't even think about that. That's right. Yeah. They had a smoke room before they rebuilt it. You, you could just walk in there, like have a cigarette inside. <laughs> like, what the fuck was that even? <laughs> what I like most about that place, I think it's like uh, Mafia Comedy was there, and I, I think it's. It's always been this way with Mafia. If it's on a Friday and Saturday night, mm -hmm. you can never really relax there because you never really know what it's going to be like. Mm -hmm. it, it, exactly. it can be, if you're doing Friday and Saturday, it could be amazing on Friday and then just dog shit on Saturday. Yes. Or the other way around. Or both nights will be bad or both nights will be good. Yeah, it's, exactly. Exactly. I remember that. And you always got like a, like that was a common thing known thing among comics like if you go to big ben and you do your material don't trust that material because they laugh at anything but if you go to mafia and they laugh you got something because like every once in a while you get those shitty shows and they don't laugh at barely anything yeah so you just that you got an honest response basically not that they were really fake at big ben it was just a great vibe there always so you, like it's almost impossible to bomb there, even though you you bombed. Oh, okay. <laughs> definitely bombed. <laughs> That's not easy, but yes, I have absolutely succeeded several times. <laughs> and I remember Victor Lemire, he he performed at, at Big Ben, and he did just I I believe it was the worst set I've ever seen at Big Ben. <laughs> it was just it was just people were just so like anti laughing basically. <laughs> And I, oh, we still laugh about that sometimes. Like I can even fucking write to him sometimes just for the. Remember that fucking Big Ben set? Yeah, that was fucking awful. <laughs> yeah, that was a lot of. I, I miss the people the most, like from performing, like the people you would meet, like Victor Linnea, and like when Donny Nude used to do it. I was great friends with him. He was uh, even like visiting me sometimes in Uppsala oh, yeah? back in the day. And of course you and Henrich and uh, like Adil, I really miss seeing Adil. Adil is a fucking lovely human being I, I, and also an asshole at the same time <laughs> uh, and also fuck his mother. And, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but I, I miss, uh, that's what I miss the most, the, the hang, like the whole thing. And that's why Mafia stands out in my mind because of that fucking backstage Yeah, that was hang. the most... That was the best hangout club I've yeah. ever been at. Yeah, it was so much fun. So much fun. And Autumn Flam getting high back there and everything. <laughs> and everything. It was so fun. <laughs> you never knew what you would get there. I filmed my, uh, I mentioned before I didn't have a 40 year crisis, but I, I kind of did. Mm -hmm. That's I, I filmed a special. Mm -hmm. I was going to do my, my, like, my one hour special. Mm -hmm. And I just, I had so much hubris because I, I really should, what I should have done, because I filmed it on Friday, it was Friday and Saturday night. Mm -hmm. I was headlining both nights. I wore the same clothes. We filmed both nights. I thought, okay, I'm going to cut, 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 cut the best stuff from Friday with the best stuff from Saturday and make it look like one long, mm -hmm. one long set. And what I should have done, I should have done the same set Friday as I did Saturday mm -hmm. just to get the really the best. Mm -hmm. 
but I just wanted to show what I could do. So I did. I, I wrote two separate forty-minute sets. All right. I just, I just want to show I, that that's how much stuff I've got. <laughs> but I should not have done it that way. So on, on Friday, it was like half full or half empty, depending on how you want to look at it. Was this at the Underbar? Then? The Underbar bar. Yeah. I remember you recording this thing, but I don't really remember where it was or anything like that. Yeah, it was the Underbar bar. Mm -hmm. So on the Friday night, it was like half full, and but there were, the crowd was great. It was like a really good feeling in the room. And then Saturday was sold out. It was like just standing room. It was absolutely packed. Mm -hmm. And about halfway in, I just realized, like, shit, I'm bombing. <laughs> I was like, not only am I bombing, I'm headlining, and I'm filming. There's like four <laughs> cameras in the room <laughs> recording me bomb. I can rewatch this thing <laughs> later. And my back was just soaked. I had the flop sweat. Like, it's like, <laughs> like you don't know, if you, if you don't really know you're bombing until you can feel drops <laughs> just coming down your back. But I'm happy. I would say I turned it around though. By the by, the end of the set, I actually turned it around. Mm -hmm. So so by the end of the special, uh, there's actually material from the Saturday night, which which was good. <laughs> but it also reached the, also a good sign for me in my like development as a comic. Like up until that point, if I was in the middle of a set that was not going well, I would just walk off stage. <laughs> just like all right, well this is going to shit. So bye. <laughs> and then you worked and you turned it around. Yeah, I turned it around. So that, that was a good feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well. Was that your worst bombing then? Filming and everything? Well, filming, yeah. Uh, my worst bombing. Uh, that was in... I don't have I told the story yet. I'm not sure I have. My absolute worst bombing was uh, Soul in the Comedy Club. Oh, I remember Soul in the Comedy Club. I was, yeah. I was, <laughs> was so, I was so excited. Yeah, it was oh, Place. Oh, my God. I was so excited uh, because it was like, I was going to do like 12 minutes. It was my longest set ever by far. Mm -hmm. And I invited like a bunch of people to see me. And I just bombed so terribly. <laughs> was there a lot of people there, or was it like besides uh, your friends? No, well, no, there was not a lot. Well, yes and no, there were a lot of people there, mm -hmm. but not for the show. No. <laughs> and there was, and there was no stage, so there was just a table. Like it was like standing, it was like standing like this. Like I'm like next to a table full of people who were literally annoyed there was a show going on. It's like right here, there's someone who's just visibly agitated. I'm actually speaking to the microphone. <laughs> it was so bad. That was a that was a Thursday. I, I think I went to I went home. I was in Solna where I lived, mm -hmm. so I walked from the bar to my apartment and just like I think laid in bed for the rest of the four day weekend. <laughs> just, just... Yeah, I remember Solna Comedy Club. I performed there once, and they had to postpone the show because uh, Oiko was having a match. Yeah, there was usually a stadium right across the street from the yeah, bar, yeah. and their fans were there, uh, so. They were basically singing louder than any speaker could <laughs> could go, <laughs> so they used to uh, we're just gonna postpone it like to later, and then they pushed it like a half hour, and it went into overtime their fucking game. Okay. So you had to push it another half hour, and then it went into penalties their fucking game. <laughs> so you had to push it another fifteen, <laughs> and fortunately they won. So we figured like oh well maybe they'll stay because they're happy, but basically they were they were singing through the first three comics nobody caring that anybody <laughs> was on stage and that was so awful and luckily i didn't perform when they were there they like they realized like oh we're, there's a, there's a show going on we don't want this so they basically walked out and walked into to another bar uh, so i got to perform but then it was like four people left in the room and that was just so <laughs> awful it was so awful Oh my god, and I remember Simon Garishas be performing the same night, and he always did good. But at that night, he was just so, uh, you could just tell he was just fidgeting with stuff, and he was just like, hey, hey, good, you funny thing you said. <laughs> oh my god. That was the worst thing about that night that I bombed, because, like, I mean, it was, everything was against me. It's like, the people here don't want the show. It was a wireless microphone that just screamed feedback if it moved <laughs> in any direction. <laughs> The, like, the speaker was like right by my head, so so I felt like I was screaming. But people like in the back of the room, they're actually you. trying to pay attention, couldn't hear a word I was saying. <laughs> it was just so bad. So I, I walked off stage and just felt like absolute garbage. But then the next comp went up, and also bombed. <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh okay, well maybe it's, it's not me. And the next comp went up and also bombed. And I thought, oh, okay, well, all right, it's all right okay, it's, 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 it's the room. And then Melody Melody Farshan went on, <laughs> and just killed like like <laughs> she turned everyone's attention to just like people who didn't care about the show before 
all pay attention. And it was a good show from that point on. It's like, oh, oh my it. god, <laughs> that's the worst feeling ever. <laughs> like you're blaming the room, and then all of a sudden, somebody comes up and just dominates. The yes. room. <laughs> oh, it's me. It's not. It's oh, I've, not I've, I've said that a million times. Which my comic book comes on stage like, oh, it's just, it's a tough crowd. Yeah. This, is, this is a tough room. It's like, no, it's like you're just not very good. <laughs> oh my god, my my worst bombing, or maybe not worst bombing, but worst show ever. Was in uh, in Borlänge, uh, up in Dalarna, uh, and we were supposed to do two shows at the same place, like this British pub place, uh, whatever it's called, Williams, Harrison's, whatever. And um, we did one show like at six, and then one another show at eight or nine, I think it was. And the first show at six, like there were. Uh, a group of girls sitting right here uh, like I'm on stage and they're here and there was two drunks in the bar and then no other people it was just basically <laughs> five six people in the whole room <laughs> so I performed and these this, these like group of girls here they didn't like me at all or my, t my material or anything so they just basically didn't laugh at all these two drunks they laughed a lot and uh, so then we go to the nine o'clock show uh, or eight or whatever it was and the room gets packed so i'm excited about performing the second time uh, but the same group of girls is right here and they're just getting drunker and drunker <laughs> and drunker at every fucking comic walking up and when they see me walk up on stage i can audibly hear them say oh no <laughs> <laughs> And I'd still do the same material I did as the first show, uh, and they just start to go like, ah, oh, ah, oh, like, like not even not even the one I kind of like, just a, just a disgusting like like ah, oh, ah, oh. and then I'm performing, and one of those girls just start raising her hand, like, and I'm just ignoring her, and she's just keeping her hand up and just sitting there. So I turn to her and I go like, well, this isn't school. Uh, so I'm not gonna give you the word and fuck you <laughs> and she just went uh, she just went ah, excuse me and I said well and then you can piss in your own mouth the other people like in the, in the crowd they just laughed their ass off they thought it was funny as hell uh, and then she said piss in my own mouth and I said yeah well physically you can just lay on your neck and you piss right up and the angle of that and I was just <laughs> explaining like an equation for her like how she would do it and people were just dying laughing I remember seeing a, like 10 cell phones going like this up to my face and then to them and to me and to them and to me so like people like oh it's going down and uh, I finished my set like and they were still like talking shit to me like the whole I like, started ignoring them uh, and uh, I walked off stage and the one girl I told to piss in her own mouth she just walked up behind me grabbed the microphone and started going ah, I fucking kill you I fucking hate you fucking asshole I fucking hate you and then like the the, the guy who worked the bar he just came and threw her on the shoulder and just walked out with her <laughs> screaming at the, the whole way out and uh, I remember standing in the crowd and everybody just started looking at me and I just went like, oh, well, I don't know. I don't know what that was. And then another girl from that group stands up and she goes, I'll fucking kill you, fuck you, I hate you. <laughs> and then the, the guard comes in and he throws her out too. And uh, then someone in the crowd tells me that's her mom. Like the first girl's mom <laughs> stands up and said the same <laughs> shit. <laughs> she got thrown out. And then this drunk guy walks up to me with his beer and he just goes, well, you can't really say that to people. And then, and then I, I, I ask him not to be like aggressive or anything. I just ask him like, well, what do you mean? Like what part couldn't I, couldn't I say? And then he just stood there for an extra few seconds and he goes, I oh, want never mind. And then he just walks away. <laughs> So then we're standing there. It's me, Jan de Linskog, and like I don't really remember who else was there. Um, and we just standing there talking. And then, like the guy who works security at the bar, he just walks in and he just goes, "Well, they're calling people outside to kick your ass now." <laughs> so 
we have to sneak you out through this other Chinese place that we're connected to <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> and uh, just get you out of here because they, they're going to be here and they're criminals. So basically, <laughs> they're going to come here. So I remember us sneaking out the back and walking around the building and coming out a parking lot and you could see like a few hundred meters down where they were still standing outside the bar just going like, ah, 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 ah. you can not tell what they si were saying or anything and we just jumped in a car and left Borlenge. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was fucking awful. <laughs> but it didn't bomb then but it was just like it was such a weird show like we'd be... <laughs> <laughs> well, these, ones, these ones you remember. You don't yeah. remember the, the good ones. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but my worst bombing must have been like that second show at, uh, at Komikaze uh, when I had four friends in a packed room and I thought I was a shit. And I was just basically shit. <laughs> that was just so, that was so awful. Like nobody laughed. And Mike actually sent me a clip of it afterwards. Really? So I rewatched it once. I had so much anxiety just rewatching it. I just <laughs> deleted it from my computer. And unfortunately, I wish I had it now. Yeah, but it's great to have those. I wish I could see it now because that was just so awful. <laughs> I found so I found one not, not so long ago. It was a couple years ago. Now uh, I was just like, going through my computer, just looking through like different video things. Mm -hmm. And I have a recording of me you know, before the beard. At Underbar Bar, mm -hmm. just eating complete shit for six <laughs> minutes. It's so, it's so bad. <laughs> but the great look back on, it's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> awful. Don't you feel it, like, crawl in your skin a little when you listen to that? Because that's how I would feel. Like, I would feel, like, yeah, I would still laugh at it and would still see the humor in it, but I would still go, like, oh, fuck, that. this is so awkward. You're still listening to this shit. And for me, like, when I, when I see, when I saw that video in particular, mm -hmm. when I'm just bombing, and yeah, I am feeling like cringy, <laughs> but I'm not like cringing because the crowd didn't like me. I'm cringing at my own performance no, or, right. or how, how bad it was. Like, okay, okay I, I could have done that better. I, I can see how they or... saw it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. It, <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and, that, and after that show, you just went down and you said, all right, it's a tough room. <laughs> exactly, that fucking room. exactly right. You just blame the room. <laughs> God, one of my, uh, one of, I, I performed so little last year, mm -hmm. uh, but... but but one of the gigs I did, it was just god awful. Like I actually, I actually even like commented, like you know the expression, like it's so quiet you can hear a pin drop. Yeah. Like I, I, I tweeted like I'm pretty sure I heard someone think about dropping a pin. <laughs> that's, 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 <laughs> that's how quiet. That's it was. how bad it was. <laughs> oh my god. There's something look, looking on the crowd and just seeing a woman like just, you can see her tonsils. She's yawning so hard. <laughs> <laughs> that was awful. Was that a comedy club then, or was that like that was a, a mafia? Club? That was a mafia. That mafia. Was, no, no mafia. Uh, it was a star, a star comedy club. Mm. Oh so, yeah, just hate complete shit. But then now, but now, like when it happens, I don't, I don't like that first one. I, that first one I bombed. I feel, like I said, I felt horrible for for days. But I mean, since then, like we have a gig and it doesn't go very well. It's like oh, okay, well, yeah. Yeah, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel very good, but it also doesn't feel like the no. end of the world or no. Exactly that that first. That's probably what made that what my worst bombing is was it was my second time performing, so I was just basically I had no frame of reference to like how awful it was or like anything like that. But I still like this was it felt so awful that my friends got there and they got to see this awful gig and everything. But then the same friends came like a different time and I killed, so they got to see like both sides of it. Yeah. Uh, then it just got and it just got better and I just got better with in dealing with it and uh, like like you said now it doesn't really face me if, if it if it happens because you know like, you know it, oh it's just a bad night I was bad or the crowd was not really good <laughs> or whatever it was just something was off this night yeah and I know on the Celine basically he hates when you try to blame the room or anything like that. Yeah, he always goes, no, yeah. it's you. It's you. <laughs> <laughs> you can't play in the room. It's you. Well, one experience I had at Underbar Bar, was when I, I used, that's when I started hosting, uh, was, was Mafia, but it was there. Mm -hmm. And learned a lot from hosting there. Because uh, it was one night that went on and the crowd just did not like me from the start as, as a host. Like, it's my, it's my job. <laughs> so now you have to get up several times. Yeah, yeah. So that's, it's, it's my job to get the crowd going, and they're just not interested in a word I had to say. So I was like, oh, okay, well, here's the first comic. And went on stage, and that first comic went on and just bombed. And I 
was like, oh, the shit, I gotta, gotta turn around. So I went, went back on stage again and was just trying to be a little more energetic or something. They gave me nothing again. <laughs> went on stage, next time went on, also bombed. Oh. And then I was, at that point, I was just like kind of pacing, just thing like trying to think like, what what do I have? Like, what what do I have? What, what guaranteed gold do I have? And I couldn't think of anything. And then Lazo, who ran the place, came like charging directly at me and he just had this like fury in his face and i was just thinking oh fuck shit okay now he's gonna tear me apart for doing a bad job mm. and he just got my face and just like like had a finger out and just said he said this crowd sucks it's like it's like it's your job like you yell at them you have to tell them they <laughs> suck <laughs> and that's exactly what i did i went, I went on, i just went i just went on stage and just said like this is folks this is a show you have a job to do we're doing our part <laughs> <laughs> you need to be better, and they actually they actually turned the night around. Oh right! And that that was the, that's like one of my like key memories, like my, like my career, my established career. <laughs> of looking back, like okay, you know what? Sometimes the crowd can suck, yeah. but yeah. but I, I also agree with understand. Like you can never really blame the crowd either. Like like with Melody at that Solon Club mm. that Did was that able to turn able to turn around. Yeah. You should be able to turn around. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I always love uh, like uh, Henry's line. When he's bombing, uh, and he just goes, "I have twelve more minutes." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or like twelve minutes left. And yeah. like, <laughs> even though he's had four minutes or whatever, and it doesn't matter. <laughs> but he's like, oh, I have twelve minutes left. I have to sit through this shit. <laughs> From what you've seen, because like, you haven't been performing very much, but you've you've come out to shows a few times. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you feel like the scene is much different than it was when you first started, or is it the same? No, it's basically the same. Like from from what I remember, it uh, just a lot of new faces. Like uh, that also struck me when I started performing again. Like okay, and now I know like one person on the set list, and you used to know everybody. Yeah, and or at least know who everybody w was or something like that. But now it just it's just so, like you said, so many so many young people that are just I don't know who you are, and I don't. I don't know uh, who this guy is, who this guy is anymore, and that's. I think that actually like helped along with the whole like not performing as much thing because I used to know everybody, and now I don't know anybody. Mm. It's the same reason I don't go go to bars anymore. Like I used to know everybody in the bar, like, but now I don't know anybody. So what's the fun in that? But uh, no, it hasn't. It hasn't changed much. Like I. Not from what I've seen, at least. Like the, the, you've been out more than me, though. Have you like noticed any difference, like in material or anything? No, for me, it's pretty much the same. Yeah. Uh, like, because the clubs come and go. There are certain clubs that've been around forever, but mm. sometimes there can be like eight clubs open a week, and sometimes mm. there's only two, and then yeah. they, kind of, they wax and wax and wane. Yeah, yeah exactly. I think it's more or less the same. But I still see like a lot of new faces, yeah. and that's actually one question I've been asking a lot uh, on this podcast is. Like, how does it feel for you? Like, let's say you're gonna, you're gonna go to Big Ben mm -hmm. and go perform, and you walk in and it's a room full of comics that we've never seen before. They've never seen you before, mm -hmm. and they're not giving you the time of day because they don't know who you are. They don't know how much experience you have and how long you've been doing this. Exactly. Do you do you feel like any kind of like a like anxiety over that or or, or anger? Or yeah. Like, don't you know who I am? No, no, I don't feel any anger about it. I think it's actually all funny because. Uh, uh, I, I know I'm gonna go up and do well, so they're always gonna be like they don't care about me because they have never seen me on stage right. or anything like that. They have they have no frame of reference to who I am. So uh, so I think it's actually more fun to just go up and if it, if it goes really well, kill in front of them just to go like oh well fuck you I know how to do this shit <laughs> <laughs> because last time I performed at Big Ben it went really really well. Uh, it was like December last year, like 2018 then, basically. Okay. Yeah. 19. No, 19, 19, okay. yeah. I'm 21, 21 now, fuck. Uh, but I, I did really well, but uh, Bunderud told me that one of the other, like, uh, younger comics there just went up and like, is this first time? Uh, <laughs> because they didn't even know who I was. And, they, and then he... He thought about like playing along and just going, yeah, it's his first time. It's just a natural. But he just he just went the other way and just told him like, nah, no, he's been doing this for a long, long time. So. <laughs> but I think it, I think it's more. I think it's actually a little, a little funny. But 
Well, like I said, it, like it, I miss the hang. I miss the hang with the whole thing. Uh, miss the hang out with the old crews. It was fun. The last time I was a big band before the show, I met a guy. It was he told me it was going to be his third gig ever. Mm -hmm. So he's just starting. And then he was asking me. He just asked me like, uh, "So how how long have you been doing this?" Mm -hmm. I was almost embarrassed to say like, um, ten years." <laughs> like I'm very self conscious of that. Like it, it felt like I was saying to the guy like, "You know, if you work really hard, <laughs> you're know, being his mentor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you work really hard and really apply yourself in ten years, you can still be here. <laughs> you can still be at the same fucking place. <laughs> so, that's already worked. Yeah, I, I went there." Uh, Last uh, and so it's, it's been spring 2019. I was, I was not really performing very much there, but I went no, sorry, no, spring last year, spring 2020. Mm -hmm. When did I perform? And the host put me up first, <laughs> which I don't care. I don't care about. I don't care about going first. Not really. Like I, I like I know people like will avoid being first, like the, yeah, the yeah. plague. But mm -hmm. of course, you're going to do better if the crowd's warmed up, mm -hmm. like later on in the show. Mm -hmm. But I feel like if you if you need the crowd to be warmed up to have a good set, yeah. it doesn't really say much about you as a comic. So I don't really care about going first. For me, it was more like, okay, well, I've been coming here for ten. Like I started here, I've been coming here for ten years. Like the guy knows me, and first, huh? All right, all right. Well, that's what happened. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a for sure sign. Like, well, you're you're the new guy on the block here, so <laughs> yeah, I just put you first <laughs> because he's laid good the better days think you are later to put you on the show or before breaks even like before the first break that's a big one that's my app but that's for me that's the best spot of the night is the yeah. last comic before the break and i love that spot la and the last comic of, of the night yeah i but the, the, by then it's like it's like mafia they always do 489 <laughs> comics every night <laughs> so the last comic they're all so tired so i never like the spot there <laughs> but at Big Ben, it, it sometimes it works out and sometimes it don't because sometimes they just run run too long. Like uh, I remember Jason Robbins doing fucking I don't know like an hour uh, <laughs> after two hours of comedy. <laughs> so that's basically uh, and <laughs> the whole fucking the guidebook of how to fucking fail at Big Ben. <laughs> they didn't even care though, but that's why I was thinking. I thought of him today. I had a memory of uh, again under bar bar. So sitting like downstairs, like you know, we went all the way downstairs mm -hmm. in the smoke room. It was that area to kind of sit down. Mm -hmm. So all the comics were there hanging out before the show, and I was sitting by myself. I was writing my notebook, and at the on our table a little over, uh, Ralph was sitting with Eric Lombard, mm -hmm. and Ralph had his back to me. Eric was like facing me, and I just I don't know what they're talking about, but I heard my name, so I like, overheard. Uh, so Jason just said, uh, "Oh, Ryan, Ryan, he's a nice guy, but he's he's wider than Jim Gaffigan's knee." <laughs> And Bomberg knew I heard it. He looked at, looked at me. He just had this really she look in his face, like eh. <laughs> I love that. I'm gonna get that on a t-shirt. <laughs> like, no, I'm not. I'm not cool. Huh? Yeah. I'm not cool. I'm not 50 years old wearing a grill. Not yet. <laughs> Why did it Jim Gaffigan <laughs> me? That's a good one. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> that that's also a part of the. Uh, like the hang that I talked about, like the mi missing the hang, the good ribs. Like sometimes some people just fucking hit you with something really, really good, and you would just cry laughing yeah. because. <laughs> and it was about you even. Like you know, I just loved. I miss those. I miss those moments. I believe. I'm, I think Adil once said I was the product of retard sperm, <laughs> and I just cried. I just cried laughing because I was just picturing someone shooting and just going and just the, you go in like in a microscope and they just go oh <laughs> <laughs> i once drove him at a road gig it was uh i drove i was like three other comics in the, in the, in the car mm -hmm. he was in the back seat and for stock like stockholm driving on south so four hours and he talked non-stop the entire <laughs> trip down it was like having the radio on. It was like listening, it was like listening to talk radio. He just had a monologue one for four, four hours straight. <laughs> yeah, you can do that. You can do that. I went to Oslo with him, him and Victor Linier, and we went by train from Stockholm all the way to Oslo, and uh, I, I and he, he was just talking up a storm then also, um, and 
I remember him sitting like on the on the outside seat, and Linnea was sitting on the inside one, and I was sitting across from them, and Adil did a silent fart. <laughs> he just <laughs> leaned over a little and looked at me like, you know what I'm doing, like, you know, and then you farted, and I knew Linnea fucking hates hates the smell of farts like he hates it <laughs> and so he's just sitting there with his computer with his headphones on and you can just tell he just goes huh, huh, huh. and then he, he tries to get out this way and Adil's blocking him so he just starts climbing the wall like a fucking <laughs> lizard like oh oh no <laughs> I used to laugh <laughs> I used to laugh my fucking ass off <laughs> so funny that was so funny that ride you staying in that fucking apartment in Oslo you stayed in that right yeah it was yeah. at the Brewers fucking apartment that they owned in the middle of uh, in central Oslo basically right it was yeah. close to the whole government building where Breivik did his thing because uh, because I remember being there once and there were just uh, this big fence like in the whole in the wave of it that was after the the attacks in Oslo so I remember this big big fence like you couldn't even look into that hmm. place I, I don't think it was recent after either it was just it was several several months but they were just blocking it off and rebuilding like there at the time and yeah that's that's where uh, Victor Linear uh, I'm sorry if I'm ruining your state-driven radio gig right now, Victor, but <laughs> he opened up a taxi, he was drunk, I was drunk, he opened up a taxi and he goes, I want to go where the bomb went off, <laughs> because he didn't know the street, <laughs> and the guy goes, huh, and Linnea starts going, boom. <laughs> Boom, like that and I so I just pulled him away like Fuck, we're gonna get arrested outside this place for you doing this shit oh there's so many of those fucking road road stories that I just I miss having miss having those experiences I went to that club mm. twice so I say I was going to Oslo did the, the gig say at the apartment mm -hmm. uh, there twice the second time I was there it had been a while since I was there the first time and I didn't remember where the apartment was mm -hmm. I went straight to the club for the gig, and then after the gig, we all like went out drinking, like bar hopping, mm -hmm. and we're just with the host who was going, just waiting for him to lead me to the apartment, because I was like flying back to Stockholm, like ten things like ten a.m. flight. Mm -hmm. But it's still pretty. I want to get some sleep because I was going to go straight to work mm -hmm. after I landed in Stockholm, like like a half day of work. Uh, I, I, we got like, just, like okay, now it's one o'clock in the morning. Now it's two o'clock in the morning. It's three o'clock in the morning, and the bar is finally closing that we're in. And he was shit faced. I was like, I really have to get back to the apartment. And long story short, like he purposely caused a fight. Like he just purposely <laughs> picked a fight with someone, chased the guy for blocks. Like it was just one, it was one, the one guy he was pissed off with at was walking with like three of his buddies <laughs> down the street. The host of the show was chasing after them, just taunting him, screaming at him. And then meanwhile, <laughs> my, meanwhile, like I'm in tow, like, Stop! Come on! I don't just stop. Like, take me, take me to the apartment. Eventually, like all four of them turned around and yeah. just beat the shit out of him. <laughs> like, you just not, watched. I just watched because because I knew I knew like he wanted he wanted to get into a bar fight. Like he, we talked before, like he was kind of feeling low. Like he wanted to get into a fight. Mm -hmm. So I mean, they were like literally stomping the guy and one like oh one of the guys God. and they were they're, and they were like college like prep boys. <laughs> It's so like one of the guys like came up to me. He's like, "Oh, like you want some?" Like chest out. Like mm -hmm. I just like this is what he, he this is what he wants. <laughs> so they just got tired of kicking him and they walked away. And he just got up laughing, like they <laughs> they didn't kick him in the face. Lee, so that was good. <laughs> oh, and then we just God. walked around. Literally just walked around this, the streets for a while. And then I just went to the train station, and just waited for the first train. I just didn't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so I only stayed in the bar once. <laughs> Oh my god, yeah, I stayed in it twice. I stayed in it twice, and it was just they had its old porn mags there and everything. Like, yeah, that was there. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was was there. I heard about that in advance. It was a so weird I, place. I, I checked. <laughs> <laughs> that was the artist department. <laughs> yeah, and I, I rem actually remember they had old like movies there also because I remember watching Independence Day with Will Smith. <laughs> 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 yes, because me, I think it was me, Adil, and Victor then. And we were just laughing about how stupid of a movie it was, and we just popped it in and just started <laughs> laughing our asses off. <laughs> Welcome to Earth. 
<laughs> he knocks out with a right hook. Is this an Ali move again? What the fuck are you doing? Yeah, I miss those. I miss those fucking road, road things. Or like, yeah, like I said, the hang. The hang is just a lot of fun. A lot of fun with comics because obviously there's funny people. So obviously there's going to be a lot of laughs and a lot of jokes and a lot of inside jokes and everything and that's yeah i miss that part i miss that part the most is that enough of a draw to kind of bring you back into it that's enough of a draw for me to not like uh, just quit entirely because i haven't announced that i'm like oh, i'm officially retiring as right. a comic even though i like i wouldn't because i felt feel that's like a stupid thing for me to do like i'm nobody so why should i announce that i'm quitting stand-up but the the reason i still want to do it sometimes is because i miss that whole fucking just meeting people and just hanging with people and having a lot of fun and just so i i don't think it would be enough to draw me back into the old old days because it's still that fucking train that whole train ride right it's just gonna kill me eventually uh, but it's enough to keep me hanging around the whole scene and everything. Like Laszlo, Laszlo fucking opened the club because he loved the hang still. Like, it, or at least he told me that was one of his, uh, one of the reasons why he started. He was actually a talented comic, and then he just he liked the hang too much, so mm. he didn't want to quit, and then he quit. But he started the club. So, so no. To answer your question, no, I don't think it's enough to draw me back, but it's enough to make me stick around a little right do gigs every now and then it's a lot of fun <laughs> well now i told several war stories which is nice yeah because <laughs> that's how like the ending that's how i'm hoping to end up each episode because mm -hmm. the only reason why i'm doing this I, I also i miss the hang i, I just miss talking to our comics because mm -hmm. it's just like what did you say like we just the stories just kind of flow you start talking yeah. about the worst gigs bad gigs so i, I asked you in advance to kind of think of something to end with mm -hmm. i don't know if you, if you already told the story or if you mm -hmm. have a Mm -hmm. Something in mind, uh, like I said, like in a war, a war story. That's what yeah. you're answering. Mm. No, I believe I already. That was the boring one, basically. That I really okay. wanted, <laughs> really wanted to get out. But I, there's, there's just so many. There's just so many weird, uh, weird ass gigs that I've had. Uh, like once I performed for H and M, rent me in as like a. Uh, their comic at their their like office party thing not the off official office of H&M but a small like section of H&M okay. like that, that has stored but that store had a office party and they rented me in and uh, I'm not really a like my material doesn't really fit that whole setting as you know <laughs> and they I was I was gonna I was just pacing back and forth and they were telling me that like you can do 25 minutes you can even do more if you want uh, but I only had material for basically like 20 so I was thinking uh, like maybe I'll just stretch this out like the material that I have or try something new even I don't know and uh, I walked up they and they announced me as a surprise comic and that's always awful always 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 bad. always, always awful because nobody's ready to laugh, nobody's ready to listen to you. They want to have a band, they want to drink, they want to do their thing. And uh, so they walk. So I walk up, I do my first joke to complete silence, <laughs> complete like to a room of two hundred people. Nobody like even cracked a smile. Basically, it was so quiet. And I did my second joke, and it bombed even worse. Third joke like now nobody's even paying attention to me anymore they're not talking or anything they're just like turning their face away from me basically <laughs> because they're so ashamed of what's going on and uh, i did basically two more jokes that also bombed and then i walked off and they they were gonna pay me like two thousand krona and <laughs> the and i just basically told them that, like that you don't need to pay me like that was just that was just bullshit that was that was so bad <laughs> That was so bad. And then, of course, the girl that ran me in comes with that, that that stupid line that almost all comics heard once in their life. Well, I laughed. <laughs> like, yeah, that didn't help at all. And you couldn't hear it. Yeah, so I inside. <laughs> <laughs> and 
So, but they basically they paid me still. They still paid me. They gave me a shame champagne bottle even because like oh, well that was just awful for you. I'm yes. sorry that happened to you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was oh, that was that was one of the most awful gigs I ever had. But I could handle it better because I had a few years on my neck by, back then, and uh, I could just do a gig the day after and just do good. But yeah, that was that was awful. It was so awful. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's the worst word for you. The story I want to tell, because you're here. Mm -hmm. uh, like, So for me, so I'm an American living in Sweden. I started performing here. I pretty much always perform in English. I've, I've performed a handful of times in Swedish, but most of the time, 99% like of the time or more, it's it's performing in, in English, mm -hmm. which is not a problem, because everyone here speaks English, or at least understands English quite well, mm -hmm. up to like a certain age. I, I would say like around like 50 years old, it starts getting a little hit or miss. Like the, old, the older someone gets the less likely it is that their English is particularly strong. Mm. So if, if I perform in a room where it's the average age is much higher than a typical comedy club, it can get a little dicey, like, uh, I'm not sure how this is going to go. So I was performing, I was doing a summer gig uh, out in like the Swedish countryside, like middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. So it was this big place, restaurant, not a typical club, it's just sunlight, just brightly lit, mm. tall, high ceiling, just not a really place for comedy. But everyone was there actually was actually there for the show, which was nice. It was a pretty full of restaurant, but the average age was at least forty or more. So <laughs> all a lot of old people. A lot of old people. A lot, a lot of families, but it's a lot of old people. So I wasn't really sure how this is going to go. So I went on stage and it was like, no, no, it went okay. I could see like some looks on people's faces, like they weren't quite comprehending, but overall it was like doing well. And I don't do crowd work really at all. But I have a very heavily scripted fake crowd work bit mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. I pick a girl and I start asking her questions mm -hmm. and it gets to the point I'm asking her how, how she wants to receive oral sex. Mm -hmm. And then the big closer is, uh, can I ask a personal question? Mm -hmm. Remember, falls apart. Mm -hmm. But of course I need to pick, something, like, pick someone who actually understood English and there weren't that many options for me near the stage. Mm -hmm. But I saw a girl near the stage and I figured she was probably like 19, 20-ish. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, and she looked like she was singing with her family. Uh, that made it even funnier. That like gets even, even more awkward. Mm -hmm. So I started talking to her. Just started asking her questions. Like it, it doesn't start off harsh. It starts off fairly simple. Like, mm -hmm. are, are you have a boyfriend? Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you like in a guy? And I was just getting this blank stare. Like she just didn't understand what mm -hmm. I was saying. Like, do you not? I'm just asking in Swedish. Like, you know, do you speak? Do you speak English? And she like she shook her head, just completely derailed me, just <laughs> totally, just awful. Like okay, was just, and that was my big closer. Mm -hmm. Like oh, okay, and I like pressed on anyway. I think I just got like pressing on, mm -hmm. and like someone like leaned over and I like, started translating <laughs> the questions for her, which didn't really work. And I just like <laughs> left the stage like oh, okay, uh, that didn't that didn't work. And then after the show, or like actually as soon as I walked off the stage. The host came up to me and said, "That that's Jim Croon's family. That's Jim Croon's <laughs> sister." Yeah, I remember this. I remember this story. <laughs> it's like no shade in your sister, but how does she not understand English? Oh, I don't know, man. <laughs> no, it's just my mom is awful at English and everything. So, yeah, I, re I remember you telling me this story, and it was just I was, I was so so awkward. That was my family, basically. You were, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you you were not there. You, like no, you I weren't wasn't there. there. I wasn't there. It was you. This club was out where my parents lived, like basically not far away from where they live. So they they just love comedy. So they just went there. And they, well, my sister don't know English. Yes. <laughs> don't speak English very well. So. I never met her again, but I, I, I've met your parents a yeah. few times since then. I don't know if they. We didn't, I didn't bring it up. I don't know if they remember <laughs> me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think they've seen you a couple of times though, like uh, f through the years, because they actually came and saw me like ten times maybe. Okay. Like, so, so they were uh, they were always like supportive and everything, and they always thought like the crowds were like, nah, that was a bad crowd. They even would tell me like it was a bad crowd, hmm. like before I even thought about it. So they they I don't think they mind uh, uh, at all, but I don't <laughs> know if they remembered because I don't. I don't remember them telling me. I remember you telling me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was 
<laughs> That's a, such a funny coincidence. <laughs> like Pontus Strabek even roasted me in front of my family in, out there, and I wasn't even there right. that time either. <laughs> that's <laughs> right, he went there. Yeah, that's right. I remember that. Was that the same? That night was the same night. Yeah. Oh my god, my family took a beating then. <laughs> Well, we'll wrap it up. I guess yeah. you have nothing to plug. No, no, I have nothing to plug. Okay. No, no, just do your thing. Just okay. wrap up the show. I'll just sit here and watch you wrap up it's, the show. It's quite simple. So thank you, Jim, for being here. Well, thank you, Brian. Thanks, everyone, for watching or listening. See you next time. <laughs> See you.